Will you please join me for the call to worship? People of God, on this Baptism Sunday, we come seeking the presence of God. We come to offer praise and prayer, to listen to the voice of our still speaking God, and to be renewed and refreshed through the word and sacrament. So rise now as you are able in body and spirit and sing for joy. God is here.
gracious and loving God, we thank you for this day. For we know that this is the day that you have made, and we rejoice, and we're glad to be in it. As we come on this Baptism Sunday, be with us as we worship your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning. You may be seated. Welcome to worship here at Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church on the second Sunday of the year. It's Baptism Sunday in the church calendar year. So lots going on. A few announcements before we go on with worship. Uh, there is a board of directors meeting this coming Tuesday at uh, 7 o'clock, 6.30 for the board. Um, if you want to see what the board is doing, you're welcome to come join us as a spectator um, for our regular session that begins at 7 o'clock in the community room. Next Sunday is Brunch with the Pastor following worship. Come join us as we uh, gather um, up at Cafe Central following worship um, at 12.30 and a little brunch, a little conversation, and some just good food and conversation. So that'll be next Sunday after church at 1230. There's still time to order script for the beginning of the year. Um, app, uh, script order forms are either in the narthex or online. You can uh, fill them out and throw them in the offering basket. The deadline for that will be um, two weeks from now on the 22nd. Um, you can uh, do that uh, either online or, I guess, or in person. As well as in a few weeks, we do pack the pantry. It'll be the first one for the year um, as we collect uh, non-perishable goods for our friends at Vivant and Courage to help keep the food pantries stocked so those who are in need have something plentiful and something nutritious as we go into the, into the year. That's all the announcements I have for this morning. So as we continue with worship, let us hear God's word. Our Hebrew lesson comes from Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9, taken from the Inclusive Bible. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I have endowed you with my spirit, that you may bring true justice to the nations. You do not cry out, or raise your voice, or make yourself heard in the street, so gentle that you do not break a bruised reed, or quench a wavering flame. Faithfully you will bring forth true justice. You will neither waver nor be crushed until justice is established on earth. For the islands await your teaching. Thus says Yahweh, who created the heavens and spread them out, who gave shape to the earth and what it produces, who gave life to its peoples and spirit to its inhabitants. I, Yahweh, have called you to serve the cause of right. I have taken you by the hand, and I watch over you. I have appointed you to be a covenant people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to free captives from prison, and those who sit in darkness from the dungeon. I am Yahweh. This is my name. I will not yield my glory to another god, or my praise to idols. See how former predictions have come true. And now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I tell them to you. May God bless the hearing of these sacred words.
Will you please rise as you are able for the reading of the scriptures? Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 15, taken from the Inclusive Bible. In Christ the fullness of divinity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you find your own fulfillment in the one who is the head of every sovereignty and power. In Christ you have been given the covenant through a transformation performed not by human hands, but by the complete stripping away of your body of flesh. This is what circumcision in Christ means. In baptism, you were not only buried with Christ, but also raised to life, because you believed in the power of God, who raised Christ from the dead. And though you were dead in sin, and did not have, and did not have the covenant, God gave you new life in company with Christ, hardening all of our sins. God has canceled the mass of debt that stood against us with all its hostile claims, taking it out of the way and nailing it to the cross. In this way, God disarmed the principalities and the powers and made a public display of them after having triumphed over them at the cross. Hear what the scripture says today. Thanks be to God. Amen. Come to prayer with me this morning. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for who you are and we thank you for how you have poured out your spirit upon us this morning and every morning. But thank you for how you present this opportunity to help us to get back to the basics, resetting ourselves and reminding us just of the simplicity of seeking you. Allow us to take our spiritual disciplines and reestablish them or possibly do them in a different way. Show us the way, show us the path, and lead us to your truth. And I ask you to touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken, and the words that come from my mouth, along with the meditations on each and every one of our hearts. May they ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. So last week we started our new series, New Year, New You. And as we discussed, it's the time of year when many of us are making those New Year's resolutions, or maybe a thinking of areas in our lives where you would like to see some change. And that's pretty much where we have designed this series to go over the next several weeks. Excuse me. And it was interesting because last Sunday, um, it was interesting that only a few people caught that when I started my sermon last week, I didn't start with an opening prayer. And it wasn't that I was making change, it was just that I overlooked it. <laughs> but it's all about thinking of what it looks like, or how do we develop those tools and learn some of those principles or those positive, lasting changes that we can make in our lives. And how we're going to go about it is that we've been using the New Testament book, Colossians. And it's this letter that Paul wrote over 2,000 years ago, 
trying to see how the ideas and the principles that he has put out at that time can certainly help us as we're thinking about making certain changes in our lives. And if you were here last week, we spent a little bit of time looking at Paul's opening prayer or letter and from what or somehow we pulled out this formula for change. And if you missed that, you can always go back online and catch last week's sermon. It's this change process that Paul goes back over and over again as he works through this letter. And as a reminder of this formula, it was a commitment to living a changed life which leads to changed behavior, which leads to measurable results. And so if we see in an area in our life that we'd like to see changed, once we believe that that change is possible, then we commit to doing it. Well, we ought to lead to doing that and changing our behavior. And then those changes will hopefully then lead into the results in our lives that we can measure. So this morning we're going to somewhat pick off where we left off last Sunday. And as we ended last Sunday, I invited you to stop and take some time to possibly identify in your own life those things or something that you possibly are looking to change or to have happen in 2023. And as I said last week, maybe you've already come into this new year with your plans all in place. And if you haven't, that's okay as well. But I'd encourage you to stop and rethink it and even put that needle on the scale as you move forward, possibly even with our health. Commitment to living a changed life leads to changed behavior, which leads to measurable results. So when we stop and think about change in our lives, there really is only a couple of behaviors that we can change. And I, for th I think for me, the best term or example to think of in doing this would be as we want to lose weight. I mean, it's when we talk to the doctor and you tell him or her that you want to lose some weight. And I can bank that on 99% of the times that they will give you two suggestions. Besides wiring your mouth shut for three months, they usually give you the answer, well, you better eat right or eat better and exercise. Am I not right? You can eat better. You can change what you take in. You can eat fewer calories or you can take in healthier calories. Like instead of eating the chips and pizza that we all like, switch it to those fruits and vegetables that we really don't like. So you can change what you are taking in and you can also make changes into what you do. You can exercise more and go to the gym. You can decide to take the stairs instead of the elevator. But when it comes to that exercise and losing weight, it's pretty much one of the two options or some combination of these two things that are going to get you ultimately where you want to be. And I would say at the same time, this pattern is probably true for anything that we are wanting to change within our lives. Any area that we are trying to change, that these two things are the power to change as far as our behavior and what we choose to take in and then what we choose to exert what we then choose our actions to decide to take in doing so. In any area where we are trying to change our behavior, there usually are two broad stroke options that we have. And then in this letter to the Colossians, when Paul is talking about change, he actually spends a lot of time talking about changed behavior. And I'm going to take this week and next week to split the equation to talk about this. The first part of the equation, as we already may know, is what we choose to take in. And then next week, we'll talk a little bit more about the other side of it, what that we choose to take out. This morning's scripture was pretty clarifying and it said, we heard, we heard Paul saying, in Christ you will find your own fulfillment in the one who you have heard of the sovereignty and power. And we know this from, this actually is part of that letter. And as a reminder, this was a letter that Paul wrote to some young Christians who lived in this, 
the Greek city-state of Colossia, and we learned last week that he wrote this for a particular reason. If you recall, this church had just gotten planted, and they were on their own, and if you remember that these outside teachers started coming in, and they started showing up and teaching things that Paul simply knew that were not true or not right. It was most likely that they were being confused of the nature who, of who God actually was and the gospel of which Paul wanted to try to correct. Paul wanted these things to go in an order so that he wrote this letter. So maybe ask yourself this question this morning. How does knowing this background that we've heard the last couple of weeks about Paul and about this letter possibly help us read through this and make sense of it. If Paul's trying to correct things that weren't true, and he chose to say that we are in the, that, that he chose of what we heard first in the scripture lesson this morning, where he said, in Christ, the fullness of the divinity of lives bodily forms, and that in Christ we find our own fulfillment and the one who seeks the head of every sovereignty and power. And why does Paul choose to say it what, of what we just heard? Well, possibly the reason is sort of this false teaching that's being out there and is being spread, and maybe that they were trying to get this idea of just maybe that Jesus wasn't fully God. He was connected to God somehow, but maybe he wasn't quite the real deal. And because he wasn't fully God, the work he did was actually being the work he did was actually been enough to bring onto this fullness of life from what he wanted. And because of these powers and authorities, you have to understand that they weren't actually being defeated. But in fact, they were still out there, and then there were some holds on all of this, and it became this deal to be dealt with. Now, Paul hears all this stuff is going on, and he tells them, you know, None of this is true. Don't believe what you hear. He puts all this in a letter to remind us that Jesus Christ is fully God, fully man in him, and for this fullness of this deity that swells within this bodily form, and it's not just God fully, it's enough to bring into life that we have life within each of us. Because of who he is, and because of the power of what was done, and even the power that's done with us, there is no power in authority that has any holds over our lives. Paul throws out this idea, but then later, as we heard at the end of that scripture lesson this morning, as he reminds the people in Colossia that they buried, that in baptism, that we are, only, that we are not only buried within Christ, but we are also raised to life because you believe in the power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You see, Paul is reminding them, saying, hey, look, when you decided to identify Christ in baptism and when you put your trust and faith in what God has done through that life and death and the resurrection of Jesus, something remarkable happened. You have been raised into a new life. You're back in that old you're not back in that old life anymore because of the decisions that you make. The faith that you put in Jesus, you now have a new life and things have changed. And for you, Paul continues on and talks about this some more. And as he gets further, he basically says what this all means are these powers that are out there, that he reminds us that change happens. So as you go into the next portion of all of this, and if we go to the next portion of the letter that we probably didn't hear, it says, and through you, you were dead in sin and did not have covenant. God gave you new life in company with Christ, pardoning all of our sins. God has canceled the massive debt that stood against us in the hostile claims, taking it out of the way and nailing it to the cross. In this way, God disarmed the principalities and the powers and made a public display of them, having triumphant over them at the cross. So what's actually being said is, before you put your trust and faith in God, there is something on the books that you owed. 
There was the sin that separated you from God. But Jesus changed all of that, and that debt had been wiped away because he was nailed to the cross. And we're back in that right relationship with God. And from all of that, these results become what is part of all of this. So he says, having disarmed the powers and authorities, this Jesus, this Jesus who's done all this, he's disarmed those powers and authorities. He's made a public spectacle of them, winning it over by the cross. And we hear Paul continue to say that, look, because of what Jesus has done, these powers and these authorities that you have, that you don't have anything to worry about anymore. Because Jesus has put them all in their place and has made it public. And because that he is Lord and he's in charge, that we really have no claim over these things in our life. Paul pretty much is saying this is all the truth and nothing but the truth. Kind of like when you're on the witness stand, the whole truth and nothing but the truth and all that. Here's why, in my opinion, I think Paul is so focused on this idea of making sure that, that all knew this to be true. Because if you think about it, this letter really is about change and how change in our lives and the full service that we see, that we live, how God created us to live. I mean, Paul just knows that if people are going to change, they're going to have to take it in a steady diet, which is true. And you've got to make sure that they are learning what is true and bringing it into their life, basing their, through their decisions on what we make. He also knows is that we don't take the right steps and that we don't take what is true, then we'll usually end up making poor decisions. And I think for us, if we really want to see change happen in the most meaningful way, that we have to make a commitment to what is true. And if we're looking at that change in a spiritual sense, that we've got to remember what is true about God. As individuals, if we make bad decisions or informations, then the results are probably going to be tragic. And this was what Paul was driving at. He's saying that for us, if we want to make changes in our lives, then we need to know how to make those changes and know what's true and to have that information of bringing everything to a true picture and even more accurate so we can make those right decisions and have us be where we want to be in the right place. Otherwise, we will probably spend all of our time and effort and all of our energy and even spinning our wheels as we don't move forward in the life that God has for us. So I guess taking that steady diet of truth is the first step that Paul gives us when it comes to changing what we take and changing that part of our behavior. Now, not getting ahead of ourselves, but if we preview a bit further is if we go into chapter 3, which is the, the next portion of all this, Paul pretty much is telling us that since you have been resurrected with Christ, set your heart on a set your heart on what pertains to higher realms and where Christ is seated at God's right hand let your thoughts be on those heavenly things and not those things on earth you kind of have to lo love how Paul starts this idea with all this resurrected and that all these different versions of these words that we were raised with Christ because Paul is essentially is reaching back into those few chapters that we heard last week telling us that this is how it's done. This is who God is. Personally, I think Paul knows that there is just this incredible power in our thoughts, which is probably why this critical junction in this letter where Paul stops and says, you all need to be really careful about your thoughts that you let in, and that those thoughts that you sit in the driver's seat, that you really need to have that power of change within your lives. There's a one last point that we need to pretty much look at as we jump a little bit further into all of this. And you'll hear as you go further into Colossians that it says, devote yourself to prayer and thanksgiving. But keep alert as well. Pray for us too, that God will open the door for proclaiming the mystery of Christ, for which I am in prison. Pray that I may proclaim as it clear, clearly as I should. 
if you listen to all of this, he sums it up by saying, devote yourself to prayer. It's just like we're saying, hey, if you have a couple of minutes at the end of the day, well, maybe squeeze in a few prayers here and there. We need to make staying connected to God through prayer part of that practice that defines and shapes the scope and the course of our day-to-day -day lives. I'm sure prayer can sometimes be complicated, and it can also be something, a way of knowing, but it's a way of communicating with God. It's pretty much that your one-to-one -one pipeline that you have with God when you pray. For Paul, it really doesn't want to end the letter without reminding the people about this ultimate change that doesn't come from inside of us, but the power of change ultimately comes from God. This is why we need to devote ourselves to these things that we stay connected to with God, and that we have this truth coming and ultimate having this ability to find this power to change, and pretty much that's what God's role is all of this. God's role is that moving engine that drives everything behind us. Take yourself back to the beginning of the sermon for a moment, as I recalled that I had asked you to identify in your life where you want to see change happen and where you're wanting to move the needle over the next year. And all I want to challenge you with this week is first to identify that change. And once you've done that, then possibly, then possibly then identify the steps that you are going to take over this next year to move yourself closer to that goal that you are setting. But also, as you do this, ask yourself these two questions. What do I need to do to actually change? What possible areas in ministry, possibly, that I might engage myself with to help me focus on these goals during the course of the year in order to make these changes. So as I sort of bring this plane in for a landing, as we would say, is that this possibility is that you know you can do it. And if you need that support in prayer from any of us, you have an entire board who is willing to pray with you, you can pray with me. I mean, there's all these different resources that you have within the body of our community of faith for that support. But know that change is possible, especially when we begin to change our behavior. And specifically, if we are making commitments that we wanna make sure that we're bringing all the right kinds of things to have those tools that we need to do in order to do things differently and to move in the right direction. Nobody can do this but you. This is one of those things that falls on you to make sure it happens and at the same time that we need to figure out that God is calling you to do what you are doing. And in order to make your commitment, you need to have those real changes and to know that God is there to help guide you through that. Change is possible. Blessings upon each and every one of you this morning. Amen. On behalf of leadership here at Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church, I want to welcome all of you for joining us in worship today, whether it be in person or online. We're very pleased to have you with us. I want to encourage everybody here to fill out their green cards in person and on the back, of course, the prayer requests. If you could give us new requests or updates or anything like that, we appreciate it. Put it in the offering basket. For those of you online, give us a like or let us know you're worshiping with us on Facebook or on YouTube. And of course, you can always go online to make a donation to this church as well. You don't have to do it exactly at this moment. But it's a good thing if you can do it while you think about it. I also want to remind everybody that in two weeks, your script order forms, like I can hold this up straight, your script order forms are, are due if you're going to order scripts. You can also do that online for people who are worshiping online with us as well. So, I don't know what it is about the new year that always causes us to go, I gotta change, I gotta make changes. Nothing's good, everything's bad, I gotta do something different. I learned a long time ago, I can't do that on the new year. For me, change is kind of gradual throughout the year. I view it as a spirit working within me throughout the year. A spirit doesn't, doesn't work at me on, July, on January 1st, but all year long the spirit is motivating me. So 
slow and steady changes and evaluations of what worked for me. I hope in this new year that the one thing that doesn't change for you all is your participation and your, your connection to this community. We value each and every one of you, whether you're in person or online. We value your participation in worship, participa participation in the life and the works of the church. We value your prayers. And of course, we value your offerings and your tithes that you give. I know it's the biggest part of my life. There's a lot of things going on, but this church is the biggest part of my life. And, and it's God's Spirit, again, that's motivating me to be a part of this. I pray that you will be motivated, too, to continue to be a part of our community. Amen. As we come to the table, Jesus made a lot of changes in his life as he got to the table that evening. I invite you, if you are worshiping with us online, if you haven't, already done so to go to your pantry and get your communion elements so you can take part in communion with us. May the imparted God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts to the one who anoints you with the Spirit. We come to God our hearts through the Lord. Join all creation in praising God. We join in the chorus of glad songs to God. In a wild whisper you spoke to chaos, God of the waters of life, and your spirit raced forth, playing tag with the word. Mountains shook with the thunder. Whales whispered in the oceans. Hawks floated lazily in the skies, and the kittens chased butterflies in the field. You created us from the dusty earth, placing us in your garden of wonders so that we might delight in you and in each other. But we wandered away from you, and sin and death took place by the hand, teaching us to do all that is wrong. Prophets came in every age to testify about your hopes, but we did not want to be set free from captivity. So Jesus was sent, your future coming over the horizon, to us to be baptized by your beloved. With those who bend out and not to break, with those who long to do what is right, we lift our thanksgiving songs to you by singing. these gifts you provided the bread and the fruit of the vine let the bread we break and the cup we bless speak to us of the presence of Christ by your spirit unite us in the living Christ with all who follow Christ's way that we may be one in ministry in every place as Christ's bread as this bread is Christ's body for us send us out to be the body of Christ in the world on the night that Jesus was taken from us at the end of the meal he took the bread blessed it, and broke it, and said to each and every one that this is my body broken for you, and each and every time that you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. In a similar fashion, Jesus took the cup from the table, blessed it, and said to them that this is the cup of my, my life, which is poured out for each and every one of you. It's for the forgiveness of all sins, but we're to drink of this often, as often as we drink of this, to do so in remembrance of me. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, you spread the table before us. The Spirit anointing the bread and the cup and those gathered in this place of the water of the word. We take the broken bread, his healing grace, strengthening us to open our eyes of the blinded by hate, to free all imprisoned by fear, to Feed those who hunger for justice, 
We share the cup of salvation, its tender love nourishing us to offer balm to the hurting, to bring light to those who lose their way, but not to give us of the oppressed until justice is served. So when all righteousness is full and we are gathered with your siblings from all times and every place, we will join our voices and give you the glory by saying, God in community, holy and one. Amen. God into the world of this day and each and every day. Let us go out into the world through God's tender mercies and protection that is given to each and every one of us as we know it given to us through God the Creator, God the Savior, and God the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. I invite you to sit for the postlude. <laughs>